Now, the last time we got together, and I'm going to pick it up from here, I gave you this quote. I was reading a treatise on Christian liberty by Martin Luther. Great nighttime reading. It was a treatise on Christian freedom. And in 1 Corinthians 9, 19, I'm not going to read it to you again, but it's where Luther pulled this out of, and he gave this phrase that will be on the screen overhead, and I want to post it to you again. He starts the treatise out like this. He said, a Christian man is perfectly free, Lord of all, subject to none. That was where you can't make me comes from. In other words, Christ has freed you from the law of man. He's freed you from even man's expectations. You are a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. But then he goes on to say, paradoxically or ironically, that a Christian man is the perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. It almost sounds like those two sentences are incompatible, doesn't it? One moment you're free, but yet the next moment you're bound. And I've already dealt with the first half, so today I'm dealing with the second sentence. And so I've entitled the message, There's More at Stake Than You. There's More at Stake Than You. Than you have you found first Corinthians chapter 8 and I'm going to read it's rather lengthy but bear with me okay I'm teaching you so zone in this will get interesting here in just a couple minutes but zone in because we're laying we're laboriously laying some foundation in you so you don't get swept up in the end times atmosphere that will that will have a great falling away I'm helping you don't be a part of that crew first Corinthians Chapter 8, beginning with verse 4, Paul writes, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all are all, excuse me, are all things and through whom we live. However, verse 7, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some, with consciousness of the idol, until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Listen to verse 12. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, listen to this, you sin against Christ. This is what you call a pregnant pause. When you sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, Paul writes, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. There's more at stake than you. Now, I mentioned because I've been preaching out of the Corinthian passages, and I told you that the Corinthian church had twisted about everything that could be twisted. And I gave you a long list of all the things that Paul was writing to them to try to untangle. They twisted everything, and they twisted the concept of, of liberty they were not only sinning before God without any shame or without any embarrassment but they were sinning all in the name of liberty and their so-called liberty was causing new believers and immature believers to be offended and to stumble in their faith and so Paul begins to address this and he brings up the most immediate need and it was concerning their meat eating now I wanted to you know, I, I couldn't help but do this. I wanted to really call the message today, what's the beef with meat? But I didn't do that. 
But we do need to talk about what's the beef with meat? What's wrong with meat eating? You know, I also thought about saying there's more at stake than just you and spell it S-T-E-A-K, but I, I didn't do that either. You know, Corinth was a city. It was a Greek city, a port city. It was known for its pagan temples. And it was standard operating procedure in those days that when a person would come to worship an idol, they would bring a sacrifice. And so that sacrifice would be offered and the meat of that sacrifice would be used for numerous purposes. Some of it would be burned on the altar as the sacrifice to the false god. Some of it would be retained by the workers of the temple for personal consumption. And the rest would be sold on the market for fundraising and profit. In fact, to be perfectly candid, most of the meat available in the market would have been meat that was offered to idols. Now, unless you were a farmer or a herdsman, the only access to meat you may have had is that which had been offered on the altars of an idol and now it was being sold at the market. And so as you might suppose, if you were a Christian, a conversation might begin to arise as to whether it was appropriate to be buying meat that had been sacrificed to idols. Should we be eating this stuff? Should we be even around this stuff? How about it? What made it stickier in some instances was that those that had a Jewish background were told that this was certainly not appropriate. They had already developed rules that, you know, they not only had the scripture, but they had developed all these other man-made rules with regards to what they could touch and what they couldn't touch. And one of the things in, in Jewish rule life was that it was not appropriate to take food from a pagan uh, altar, from a pagan, pagan sacrificial uh, offering. And so a lot of that expectation came into Christianity because a lot of these early Christians, as you will recall, were Jewish people. So here at the church in Corinth, you had groups that had no sense of conviction about eating meat sacrificed to idols. You had those who did have a conviction about eating this meat sacrificed to idols. And then you had those that were new in the faith that had converted out of that paganism who were now having a tough time understanding how Christians could partake in that which was a part of their old pagan practice. Now, you've got to understand that this was a big deal. I realize going to Longhorn or Outback is no big deal anymore. But in those days, this was a big deal. Think about that. There's at least two chapters in Corinthians that's being dealt with this. There's a chapter in Romans that's being dealt with it. So we know that there are at least three full chapters in the New Testament that's dealing specifically with meat eating. Now, I want you to hear this carefully as I say this. Because if you don't hear me carefully, you, you may hear what you want to hear or you may hear something I didn't say. Paul never once gives an apostolic command, never once, to stop all meat eating for everyone. There was no apostolic command. Now he says what he's going to do. I'll get to that. But he never gives this command and he says, I forbid meat eating in the church. Never says that. You won't find it there. But what he does do is he begins to set up for the Corinthians this progression. He wants to help them understand how to begin to handle this meat eating issue. Because how many of you know this meat eating issue isn't going to be the only meat eating issue that's going to come their way? And so he goes through this progression, and I call it processing your liberty. Processing your liberty. How am I responsible with this freedom that I've now been given in Jesus Christ? So I want to process this with you, and then we'll make at least one application. In fact, it'll probably bleed over into next week. So you'll get two whole weeks of all this, this, this thought. Let's start with this. Let's define what meat means. What's the definition a kind of a definition we can pull out of this passage. This is how I would define it. It's something that might be of legitimate use, but has culturally been abused or misused, making it questionable. Isn't that fair? Meat is something of legitimate use, but has culturally been abused or misused, making it questionable. Now, Again, I'm going to go down a list, and next week I'm probably going to talk about convictions, developing personal convictions, because we need to understand how this works within our liberty. So there's going to be a larger list of things next Sunday 
especially in our current culture, in our church culture, that I, I want to help you navigate your personal convictions on. So, so we got a big list coming next week. In fact, I'll just give you kind of a, a, a little taste. I'll market it. I mean, I mean, you know, there are people that have different views of things like dancing, drinking, smoking, movies, modesty, language, bars, clothes, tattoos, a lot of meat-eating subjects out there, amen? I mean, things that can be legitimate, perhaps, and yet culturally they've been abused or misused that has brought them now into question in the minds of many believers. So what do we do with all of this stuff? So what does Paul begin to do? Well, I'm going to walk you through this, and then I'm going to walk you through one, and then next week we'll pick up some more. How does Paul evaluate meat-eating? Number one, he says this, meat offered to idols is just meat. How many of you realize today that that in your garage or maybe in a drawer somewhere you might have a crescent wrench? And that crescent wrench can be used to fix a leaky faucet and stop the drips and bring your water bill down so that you can save more money to give to missions. Isn't that true? It's a wrench. Or you can go down with that wrench to your nearest quick shop. You can hit the cashier over the head with it, steal all the money out of the register, and wander down the road and say, my, hasn't the Lord blessed me? How many of you know the issue is not the wrench? The issue is how the wrench is being used. Anything legitimate can be corrupted for illegitimate purposes. That doesn't make the thing that's being corrupted corrupt. And so Paul looks at them and he says this. He says, meat, hear me, meat is meat. All right? Now, it's being used wrongly, but meat is meat, number two. He then tells them that God originates all things, including the meat. Now, we forget that the devil didn't create meat, did he? God created meat. He created the animals. And what does the devil do? The devil doesn't create anything. He comes in, and he takes what God has created, and he twists its usage. In fact, God created, I'll just start going down the list. God created hops, which make beer. God created corn, which makes Kentucky bourbon. God created tobacco. You know that. God created hemp, which was, I think, for rope. He created all the plants. And then he looks at us and he says, has dominion over the plants. That's what he calls us, to exercise dominion over the plants. But the problem is the plants exercise dominion over us. People are addicted to certain things. So, but God created this. When he's calling us to exercise dominion, we allow, we allow the things to exercise dominion over us. But God created and he originated all things, including meat. Number three, Paul says, not everyone has the same maturity level. Now, what may be meaningless to some of you may not be meaningless to someone else. What may be understandable to you may not be fully understandable to another person. And I mentioned this to you in previous lessons. I told you that somebody that has just been one to the Lord, and maybe they're 30 days old in Jesus, that life is going to look probably different than someone who's been walking with the Lord for decades. Would you agree? We would hope that the person who walked with Jesus for decades has a life that's been fruit-bearing that reflects those decades of walking with him. Now, the 30-day-year-old one hasn't got that much time under their belt. Now, the only thing that causes us to be similar, whether you're 30 days old in the Lord or whether you're 30 years old in the Lord, the thing that's similar should be our passion to want everything he has for us, to do whatever he says, to be obedient without discussion, to follow him fully. Those two things, we can be on equal footing no matter how long you've been walking with the Lord. But we realize, saying that, that not everyone has the same maturity or application levels as maybe some of us or, or maybe you do. Number four. Paul says that meat really is not the root issue. 
He goes on to say that abstaining or eating the meat, he says, you're neither better for it or, or, or you're neither worse. He says it's not good or it's not bad. He says meat is not the root issue. Now, now I'm going to put this just in the easiest vernacular I can. You don't get extra points for eating or not eating. If you have a scorecard and you're, and you're using it with God, you can cut out the scorecard. He says there's no points for not eating, nor are there more points for eating. In fact, Paul never made meat eating a heaven or hell issue. Now hear me, if you abuse meat or whatever the meat eating issue, then it can become a heaven or hell issue. But meat in and of itself, if, as a legitimate issue, he says, it, you're neither better for it or worse for it. It's neither good nor bad. You're not getting more points or less points. It's not a heaven or hell issue. He says you're not better or worse. It's important. He, he says it's just it is what it is. Number five, your liberty and its effect is the issue. Now get this, because we, 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 don't, we don't hear this. We get hung up on the meat, and we don't understand what Paul's trying to do with the meat. Your liberty and its effect is the issue. What you do with your freedom is being watched are you following me? You say, well, I'm free to do it. Well, yeah, that's, you certainly are. But you got to understand, you're free to do a lot of things, but it's being watched, Paul says. It's not only being watched, obviously, by God, it's being watched by others. And Paul begins to tell us that the watching is incredibly important. Just because, hear me, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. Are you following me? Oh, you can, I can do this, sure. You can't stop me. No, I can't. But that doesn't mean you should. Number six. Because he says, if you cause a weaker, and I underline that, a weaker brother to stumble due to your liberty, listen, you have sinned against who? Now, that's, now don't, don't come after me. He said that. You sinned against Christ. Now, I, I began to just meditate. I like to read scripture, and I'll just meditate on it. And I want you to notice something here. This is going to be important to kind of ferret out because Paul said that our sensitivity was to a weaker brother, not a pharisaical brother. That's very important. A weaker brother, not a pharisaical brother. You know, years ago, I'll just tell you just a couple stories in, in this area. Years ago, I had people judge me for going out to eat on Sunday. So, Pastor, you go out to eat on Sunday? You bet. <laughs> well, well, aren't you, aren't you making someone work on the Sabbath? Well, I guess they either work or my wife's going to work on the Sabbath, I guess. And I'm going to live with my wife, so I guess I'll let them work on the Sabbath. <laughs> See, that was, their, that, that was in, their, in their thoughts. Now, hear me when I say this. It wasn't a weaker brother. That wasn't a weaker brother. That was a pharisaical brother there. You know, I, you know, I could have read to him out of Colossians where Paul said, you know that Sabbath stuff you used to do? It's gone. So there's, there's, there's some liberty. I, I remember, uh, Trace, you'll remember this, when you were judged for wearing colored hose. It was back in the years. These are back in the 80s. You know, when women would wear these like light colored hose and I think you had some like little pur purple hose and pink hose, light pink hose. And, and then there was there were some that came up and they told her that they that she was the worldliest woman they knew. <laughs> Just makes you grin nowadays. Now, you see, that was see her hose wasn't an issue for a weaker, a weaker sister. Her hose was aggravating a religious spirit. Are you following me? Now, I'm going to get back to here. I know, you, and I'm glad you're amening me, but get ready. Your amens, make, we're about ready to shift to some old mys here in just a moment. See, see, liberty, our liberty in those issues were not making their weaker conscience wounded. It was making their religious spirit irritated. Now, hear me when I say this, that, that there's a legitimate place 
of, of having to evaluate and filter your liberty in the light of, of a fence around you. And, and let me just tell you, those that are going to the mission field, you have to get a hold of this. Because sometimes, and again, I think it's wonderful that women can wear pants and shorts and skirts and, I mean, just put more clothes on usually. But, but, but you go to some areas and a Christian woman has to have a dress on. Because they don't understand it any other way. And we yield to that culture in order that we might win people to Jesus. So, under, so, so I understand this has to be navigated and nuanced, but I'm just telling you, Paul never said that we yield to religion. He says you yield to the weaker brother. Very important. So be careful. Be careful as you begin to navigate this. Because sometimes, you know, in other cultures, we become familiar with things. See, for instance, I know Australians use words in the pulpit that we would never think of using in this pulpit. I mean bad words. <laughs> But that's just their vocabulary. They don't think about it. I mean, you listen to some pastors in Australia, and they say things that will make you go, whoa. I say a lot, but I don't think I could get away with saying that. And, and so they have to, and, and you'll hear them say when they come to America, they have to readjust themselves in order that they don't offend, you know, massive amounts of people by the use of their vocabulary because that, that can be a cultural thing. But hear me when I say this is that Paul said again, we yield to a weaker brother, not necessarily a pharisaical brother. Number seven, why? Because there's more at stake than your personal liberty. There's more at stake. The question always arises as to why I might have to yield to a weaker brother. Why? Here's, here's what I, this is, I'm telling you, this is how I think sometimes. I'll just be honest, is that okay? Okay. See, I'm still on the burnout side of sabbatical. I've not rested yet and, and come back all, so I'm going to milk this burnout for as long as I can. There are times that I just want to say, grow up. Why don't you just grow up? Get over it. Hallelujah. Don't you know that, that, that the Christian man is a perfectly free Lord of all subject to none? I don't have to live under your stuff. I don't have to live under your immaturity. I mean, I like Luther at that point. But you've got to understand that the reason we yield to the weaker brother is because Jesus ostensibly told us to when he said that all the commandments hinge on two, the first one being to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And then he says the second is as the first. And that's what? To love your neighbor as your... So in other words, you are not an island unto yourself. You have a responsibility to your neighbor at some levels. And we have a responsibility as believers who say we are maturing to ask ourselves, is, is our life causing people to stumble? Because if it is, what we're violating is this. We're violating the law of love. Lo you, you want to talk about love in a culture that always tells us that we don't love people? Listen, love means that you yield in such a way that that there's nothing that can offend that can come through you except the truth. So you may be free to do numbers of things, but it has to be filtered. Your freedom has to be filtered through what repercussion that liberty you're wanting to exercise may release. Are you following me? That's why maturity is hard because you just don't go stumbling out. You, you pray about things. God, is this really what you want me to do? Is this really what you want me involved in? Is this really where you want me to go? Is this really something I should say? You know, all of a sudden, we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Because just because I can doesn't mean I should. Now, this whole progression begins to, I think, help us filter through how we're to handle personal liberty and how we begin to develop convictions which we're going to talk about next week. You're going to understand that everyone in this room is going to have different convictions. You may be convicted in one area that I may not be convicted in. I may yet get convicted in it. God may talk to you about something that he'll talk to no one else about. Just because he spoke to you about something doesn't make that a mandate for the whole body of Christ. It may be your mandate. And we'll rejoice. So we've got to understand that that all of these things are going to be working uh, together. But, but I want you to begin because as the culture gets darker and darker and darker and as more abuse 
comes to things that are legitimate. Man, folks, people abuse Drano. They make, I think they make meth out of Drano. Well, we just all ban Drano. You better not have Drano in your house. You see what I'm saying? So we've got to learn how to process this. We've got to get mature. We've got to grow up. We can't act like kids, you know, in candy stores and we just blindly stumble into everything. We've got to grow up and begin to filter and say, Lord, maybe, maybe I can, but really should I? Because in much the same way as Corinth found a problem, the American church has taken on many of the exact attributes of the Corinthian church. We have twisted and we have misunderstood the principles of personal freedom with regards to 21st century meat-eating issues. So I'm going to tackle those these next two weeks, but I can only tackle one this morning. And, and it's the biggie. It's the big one. And there's a number of them that we're going to, and we'll laugh along the way, hopefully, and hopefully you'll find out that there's no mandate coming from this pulpit, but I am becoming ruthlessly biblical. This one deserves a little time. It deserves a little exploration. Because drinking is as probably as good a modern illustration as we have with regards to a meat-eating issue. It is to many legitimate. It has legitimate issues. Legitimate uses. But can we at least also acknowledge that it's been abused and misused by some too? So, it has some of those analogous qualities with meat-eating, right? It, it's something that has legitimate use. And yet we all know that there has been abuses that have taken place with it. And so we have this big discussion that takes place within Christian circles as to can you or can't you or when or how or what or this or that or the other. Hey, I just want to start there to help you mature to begin to filter through how this works, I, I think, works in a believer. Now, those of you that have journeyed with me any length of time sort of know where I land already. You've heard this on more than one occasion. I got... I've got some convictions. The Lord has spoke to me, spoke to my household. And, and my convictions, obviously, are pretty strong. And I'm of the, you know, personality type. I'm a type A guy that thinks, you know, I'm right and everyone else just needs to conform to what I think. <laughs> now, I, 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 I get that's not how it works. But you all know in this congregation, or you should know, that I have convictions that are pretty strong, pretty resolute. I'm dry. My house is dry. I see no need to change that for me and my house. Those are my convictions. Those may not be your convictions. And at this point, I'm not suggesting you pick up my convictions. Recently, however, for me, you know, I'm doing a lot of work with pastors. There are nearly 300 pastors in the South Carolina Pastors Alliance. So I get to rub shoulders with a lot of different pastors. And I've met some incredible people, just people that have impressed me, that I respect. And I'm finding out that not all of them hold the same convictions that I hold. I'm finding out numbers of them uh, have different views than I have. Surprise, surprise, I am not the center of the theological universe. <laughs> and some of that has caused me to begin to reflect. In fact, probably for a couple years, I've been chewing and reflecting on all of these concepts of liberty. What's what's a legitimate biblical expectation for a believer. I mean, does a glass of wine with a steak really disqualify you? I, I, I mean, does a beer and a pizza send you to hell? I mean, does a celebratory toast at a wedding close the door and you're caught outside weeping and wailing and gnashing your teeth? I mean, I mean I've started wrestling with this because it, it's, it's just a meeting issue. And then I started thinking about history. I mean, you may not know history, but, but Martin Luther, who I just quoted to you, used to go to German taverns and they would drink and talk theology. I mean, what do you do with that? Or, or C.S. Lewis, the most prolific Christian writer of the 20th century, who smoked a pipe and drank. Oh my God. <laughs> or Spurgeon. I'm going to tell a really funny story next week about Spurgeon. But Spurgeon loved his cigars. And we quote Spurgeon. And I started thinking about all these things. And I thought to myself, Lord, I know these people. I'm not even sure I'd have them in my pulpit. And the Holy Spirit just started working on me a little bit. Now, 
Don't think I've changed anything. I'm just, I'm just, I said I was going to be ruthlessly, listen, I said, yeah, you're laughing. Some of you know he ain't changing. He ain't, he ain't going to change. I'm going to be ruthlessly biblical. I am well aware that when it comes to alcohol consumption, that there are verses in the Bible that can prove any point. Some verses, and of course you've got to get the context of all these verses, but there are verses literally in the Bible that are for it. I could, I could take you and read you verses. There's a verse in Deuteronomy that actually tells God's people that there are certain times you need to go and uh, actually pull the wine out and you need to throw a party and just have at it. That's in the Bible. Now, I, I think God would have done better if he would have checked in with me before that went in the Bible. But, none, but anyway... But that's in the Bible. So there are verses in the Bible that say that you can do Take a little wine for your stomach's sake. A lot of stomach problems in America these days. By the way. But take a little wine for your stomach's sake. There's, it's there. I mean, I fully, I fully stipulate there are a number of verses that say it's okay. You can do this. Now, let's also agree there are numbers of verses that say you really ought not do this. I mean numbers and numbers of verses that say this shouldn't be happening. So what happened is, especially in church life, because of the ambiguity, I, I, I basically mapped out four positions that Christians take with regards to their liberty on this issue. The first one is prohibition. There's absolutely no place, no alcohol for any believer at any time, at any moment. You can't do it, no way, no how. That's one position. Prohibition. Don't do it. Stay away from it. The second position is abstention. Well, the Bible may allow its usage, but there's voluntary withdrawal from its usage. In other words, what I've been kind of saying, you can, but should you? Number three is exception. Most of life, they may abstain, but perhaps on a special occasion, there might be a slight to moderate amount that could be consumed for a wedding or an anniversary, something like this. And then the fourth area is what we would call moderation, which means that there are those believers who would normally use alcohol, and it's permitted as long as one avoids drunkenness. Now, I want, I want, I want you to hear this carefully. The Bible calls drunkenness sin. You cannot, drunkenness, drunkenness, it doesn't matter how you view this subject. Drunkenness is out of bounds. Drunkards, the scripture is clear, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, hear me when I say that. Now, I always have people come up to me and they'll say, well, what constitutes drunk? <laughs> Why would you even ask that question? I mean, I mean, so what they do is we change vocabulary. Well, I wasn't drunk, I was just buzzed. I wasn't drunk, I was just tipsy. I wasn't drunk, I was just jazzed. So we change our vocabulary in order to fit within what we think. So, because they say, they say, well, what, how does, how's God going to do this? I mean, how does he know what's God going to do? I mean, is it like a 0.1 alcohol blood level or, you know, like, or like, you know, the state says 0.08? I mean, what, is, what does God make you do? Like blow a field analyzer somewhere and you blow, and God goes, yep, oh, you're, oh no, you're 0.075, you're good. What does God do? Give you some field sobriety test? I always find it fascinating whenever those questions come up. We always try to find how close we can get to lines, don't we? We always, we always want to live just as close as we can to line. It's not only in this area. It's a lot of areas of life. How close can I get? That's why Paul would say to the Thessalonians, you abstain from its appearance. That, that's the verse, to abstain from the appearances of evil is the verse that says, don't, don't set your tent next to the line. Because this much I know. I'm not in charge of these things. So I don't know. But God knows. He knows where those lines are. And though we play games in church and we play games with ourselves and games with our conscience and games with everything we do, here's the part of maturity. It's hard. I can't make you. No one can make you. But God knows. So, I have decided, to the best of my ability and with God's help, I'm going to live as consistently as I can. And since we're all Protestant, well, we should all be Protestants in this room, 
And uh, we all believe that there is a priesthood of the believer that I'm going to help you work out this area with the Lord according to the scriptures. Because one of these days, uh, you're going to have to face this and you're going to have to ask the Lord where you're to land. That sound fair? Does it sound fair if I look at you and say, you go to the Lord and you find out where you're supposed to land? Is that fair? I think that's fair. I think it's very fair. So how would Paul evaluate drinking, 21st century drinking? Well, let me just take you through it, and this is kind of what I came up with. Number one, alcohol, whether it's abused or misused for unrighteous purposes, is still just processed grain. Isn't that what he said? Meat is just meat. So that's what it is. It's processed grain. Like I mentioned above, you can abuse a snicker bar. I know people that do abuse snicker bars. I remember, I remember an evangelist in the old church we were a part of. He had to have been 500 pounds. You'd go into his hotel room after he left, and there'd be 10,000 snicker wrappers. And I'm not joking. As far as I'm concerned, that snicker bar was heroin. And he died in his 50s. So I understand that, you know, smoking may not be good for you, and abusing alcohol is not good for you, but eating 10,000 snicker bars isn't going to help you either. People abuse M&Ms. You, you can abuse food. You can, you can abuse anything. You can abuse NyQuil. You can abuse antihistamines. You can abuse airplane glue. You can abuse all kinds of things. So at the end of the day, alcohol are grains that have been processed through heat and distilling. Are, are you with me? Number two. I'm getting there. Hang on. Number two, God originated all the processes and plants involved in alcohol. Now, for those of you that have grown up dry and you've grown up in church and you felt like that was pretty much a, a standard issue, I'm probably stretching you at the moment. But just bear with me. I'm going to stretch everybody before it's over. I'm just saying to you, this isn't synthetic stuff. God put all this stuff in the earth. So you can't say corn is evil. Let's ban corn. Because there's people in the woods of Kentucky that make mash out of it, turn it into bourbon, and someone got drunk with it. Are you following me? So just because corn is used in that process doesn't make corn evil. God originated all of these things. They just put it in a metal bucket, they steam it, they put fire under it, and it happens. Number three. Remember, though, not everyone has the same experiences or maturity with regards to alcohol. Now we get to an important point. Some of you grew up in responsible homes. Maybe drinking was a feature of your home life and they did it very, very responsibly. It was something that was handled uh, maturely, adultly, legally, and a very responsible home. And, and that's great. If that's what you grew up in, that's great. But there are numbers of you even in this room, not to mention those that will be watching me and that I've met through the years, numbers of people that did not grow up in homes that handled that well. Some people grew up in homes where alcohol was handled, you know, very legitimately and others saw it abused with unbelievable and unmentionable consequences. Some of you were beat within an inch of your life because of alcohol abuse. Some of you were sexually abused because of alcohol abuse. Some of you watched uh, parents and family members get thrown into jail and they lost their jobs because of abuse. Some of you have, have all kinds of stories that it wouldn't have been like that had it not been for the abusive use of something that may have had a legitimate place. And it affects your view of it. Well, let's just admit it. If you were beat your whole life from an alcoholic and abusive father, that's going to affect probably how you view drinking a beer. Are, are you with me? Sure it would. Your experience is dictating a lot of what you're seeing. Now, understand where I come from as a pastor. Let's get back to just using me. As a pastor, for the most part, I've been doing this for 30 years. I have seen the carnage. It comes across my desk. It calls me on the phone. I'm the one that sees the violence. I'm the one that sees the prison. I'm the one that knows the DUIs. I know the death. I know the divorce. I know the bondage. I know the addiction. You don't know a thimble's worth compared to what I have seen. And it affects how you look at things. It affects how I see it. Because I'm the one that gets the phone call at 3 a.m. that's been told the person at one time, and I can tell you I've had this, church members who you thought were on target have been picked up for DUIs. I'm the one that gets the phone call. 
I'm the one that has to go home and tell the wife. I'm the one that has to keep the thing together. I'm the one that's trying to figure out how we're going to work through this. When all their friends, their Christian friends around them, are exercising their liberty and don't give a rip that this whole life is falling apart. I'm the one that's picking up the pieces. I'm the one that lets them sleep at my house. It affects how I view these things. Does that seem reasonable? I think it is. So, understand right now, I, 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 not everyone has the same experiences with regards to alcohol usage. Number four, drinking or not drinking, however, is not the root issue. Now this isn't, I'm going to tell you, just like Paul said it, it's not heaven or hell. If you go get a beer with your pizza, you're not on a bobsled for hell. I'm not that dumb. I'm brighter than that. You have a glass of wine with your steak at an anniversary celebration. You aren't anathema. You aren't disqualified. You cannot say with any integrity, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to walk in scriptural integrity. You cannot say with any integrity and use your Bible and say that somehow or another, you know, one every now and then or on occasion is somehow harmful or sinful or even a problem. Hey, even Jesus turned water into wine. And I'm pretty sure he made it to heaven. So. <laughs> so drinking or not drinking isn't the root issue. Number five, your liberty with alcohol and its effect is the issue. See, this is where I need your attention. And this is where the Holy Spirit, I want you to walk out of here and you do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. But this is what I just wonder. And I'm just, I'm thinking out loud. I wonder these things. I wonder if the people who post, let's say on Facebook, all the Christian posts about how they love Jesus and how they should serve the Lord. And then they post also on Facebook all of their drinking parties and their license to drink have ever stopped and wondered what exactly that communicates to different people. Well, I'm glad you're wearing a lampshade on your head and you're dancing on the table and you got a dos equos or whatever it is in your hand and, and you love Jesus and everybody ought to love Jesus. I, I, listen, I, I know enough to know that, that when people are drunk, they love everything. I bet they love Jesus. But what does that communicate? Does that have any place in your filter? What does it say to all the kids that are watching it that will instantly use you as their reason to? What do you do with teenagers? What do you do with struggling alcoholics? What do you do with people who have relatives in jail for DUI? What do you do with family members who have died from the drunk driver? Is there a place in all this filtering that we ask ourselves the question, should we care? Is that a consideration? Or is your liberty of your primary concern? Now think about that. And think about that in light of the two great commandments. Listen to me. I have never said, and I will say this over, I have never said a Christian cannot drink. I have said to you clearly, the Bible has two contexts to this issue. And I've clearly stipulated that you can make a case for either one. But when does your right or liberty to imbibe, yield to another's weakness? Have you ever asked that question? I think, is it legitimate? Because there's a lot of things that we're going to do next week when it comes to conviction, which is what the Holy Spirit begins to speak to us all individually as to what response am I going to have with regards to how I live my life before a watching world. I've often said this, you know, I don't know how you view things and you might not think anything of it, but if you were to suddenly go into Applebee's, and there you saw Pastor Baird bellied up to the bar. And you said, well, Pastor, what are you doing here? And I look at you and I say, ah, it's been a hard day of ministry. And I just thought I'd set a couple down before I go home. And I'm free. The reason there's a chuckle is because there's something inside of us that says that picture doesn't seem to make sense. Well, why is that? It's because there's a sense, I guess, of expectation. There's a sense of maybe some tradition that goes with these things. I don't know. But, but more than that, but there's something intuitively we all know that our lives are speaking something. 
And hear me when I say this, that I know in a heartbeat that if a teenager saw me doing something, that would be the first excuse they would use to their parents as to why they could do it too. I know that. Number six. Isn't this good? Number six. If a weaker brother stumbles over your drinking, it's a sin. I didn't say that. Paul said that. That's exactly what the scripture says. It's a meat-eating issue. If somebody picks up drinking due to your example and falls from it, you have some responsibility to bear in that. As a Christian parent, I have liberty. But I always think through what that means to my kids. Because, you see, my liberty yields to my responsibility. As a pastor, I have liberty too. I have as much liberty as anyone in this room. Do you realize that? My liberty is the same as your liberty. But interestingly enough, I understand that my liberty has a responsibility. And that not just me, but all of us are ambassadors, the Bible says, of another kingdom. And people watch how people from another kingdom function and operate. They watch our ways. Now, remember, I told you, I'm not talking about pharisaical brothers. Talking about weaker brothers. I don't care what legalists say. I don't care. My wife wants to wear colored hose. Put the colored hose on, baby. I, you know, that's fine with me. We're gonna, we're, we'll dig into that next week. This is going to be fun next week, too. We'll see how many of you come back for part two. Good news is I'm not going to be on this subject. So. so I'm not talking about legalists. I'm not talking about religionists. I'm not talking about the traditions of men. I don't... You know, I've got people that think we're going to hell because we play contemporary music. There are people who think I'm deceived because I speak in tongues. I don't give a flip. I am not bound, nor are you bound to the traditions of men. I know that there are people who would never let a drop of alcohol touch their lips, but they can't say the same about a fork. Or their gossip, or their division, or their stinginess, or their greed, or their slander, or their backbiting. Oh, but praise God, I've never drank a beer. But they've gossiped about the preacher. I would have soon they had the beer. So I don't care about those. I mean, I, but a weaker brother... A weaker brother is a different matter. I have. I have a responsibility to circumscribe my life according to the scriptures and the leading of the Holy Spirit in such a way that nobody can use my life as an excuse to walk away from God. Now, I'm not perfect, nor do I think they have the ability to dictate every matter, but but that, that is a part of the filter. We have a responsibility to the little ones. We have a responsibility to our kids and our children. We have a responsibility. You know how this works with kids. They seize on anything. Well, mom does it. Dad does it. Why can't I do it? And normally they take it farther than mom and dad probably did it. Finally, number seven. And we're almost done. There is more at stake than your ability to have a drink. You see, maturity is really hard. There are lots of things I can do, but the question really becomes, should I do it? And sadly, in our current church era, we have a generation that's far more concerned about their six-pack than they are about winning a generation. We have a generation that to even suggest that they might consider not doing that would would be the height of legalism. Maturity is hard. Getting saved is easy. See, getting saved is so easy, the Bible tells us that there's nothing you can do to get it done. In fact, you're saved by grace, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So all you have to do is basically acknowledge your sinful state, cry out to God for the need of a Savior, 
As he's empowering you by his grace, you enter into repentance and you're turned and you and it's easy. It's easy to be saved. But once you're saved, that maturity part, man, that's challenging because you got to pick up crosses. You got to die daily. You, you got to ask questions like the one I'm asking. Is my life is my life going to be used as a testimony for bringing people to the Savior or is my life being used as a sign that's keeping people away? Those are the filters we've got to take our liberty through. Hear me now. You can go out as far as I'm concerned. Go home, pop a beer, and watch the playoffs. It won't shake me up. But then again, I'm not a weaker brother. But the question is, have you even thought about it? I'm going to ask for one response, and then we're going to be done. I'm going to pray for the sick, too. And that is that everybody here, I didn't say, I didn't say you couldn't have a drink. You heard me say, didn't you, from the Bible? There are times in the Bible it says, there it is. You also understood that there are times in the Bible it says, you don't do this. We all understood, you heard me, right, that drunkenness is sin. Period. And then you all heard me say, how's your filter? How's your filter with your liberty? Oh, next week's going to be great. Because the Holy Spirit's going to mess with you about maybe what you watch on television. Just because you can, should you? You're following me? Oh, I wish I could get into it right now and spend another hour on it. It would be great. You know, the Bible has dancing in it. But that doesn't mean have, you know, ballroom sex with your clothes on. Are you following me? How do, you, how do you filter this stuff? Because the church nowadays just say, hey, the Bible says I can dance, so I can twerk. What's, what's that, twerk, twerk, twerk? I don't even know what this stuff is. See, I don't watch that stuff. You all laugh because you know what it is, right? Can you imagine twerping? Isn't that what it is? Twerking. Can you imagine twerking and then saying, the Bible says I can dance. And, and, and we don't even stop for a moment and realize that's hilarious because it doesn't work that way. Maturity's hard. So for those of you that have asked, tell your friends to tune in to Legacy Media and say, watch this message from Pastor Baird. I think it'll minister to you. <laughs>